All right, thank you. Uh, so our actual official team name was the Party Parrots. There was a team of eight of us. There was three of us here tonight. My name is Natalie, this is Colby, and then Amar. And uh, so I'll walk you through, before we actually get into our presentation, what the actual challenge was, because most participants knew the challenge, but I'll give you some backstory. So our specific challenge, there are three different ones, we chose precision architecture. So for Canadian farmers, even the slightest of business decisions can play a profound role in crop yield, quality to market, and overall profitability of the farms themselves. How can we use machine learning, satellite imagery, weather data, and historical reports to create an end-to-end -end intelligence that could have a substantial impact on farmers today? So this is the challenge. And now let me introduce you to our presentation. So crop top, transfarming Canada. So if you haven't been to a datathon, there's a lot of quirky humor involved. So uh, that aside, we'll get to the, the meat of it. But yes, uh, Party Parrots presents crop top. Oh. All right. So a very interesting fact we learned right off the gate of going through all the research of farming history is Right now, the average age of, age of farmers is 55. So if you can think about all the industries out there, when you have an industry where the average age is 55, they will transform whether or not technology is going to play a role in that. So that was as of 2016. So just add another five years onto that. So that being said, another scary statistic is that 92% of Canadian farmers right now do not have a succession plan in place. If you aren't familiar with the succession plan, that is the, the transformation process, the transition process from one farmer to another. Typically this happens uh, throughout um, history with passing it down to someone in your family, uh, whether it be your own kin or another uh, relative, a cousin, etc. Or you bring someone on well before you're going to retire. So talking about a seven to five year transition process. This isn't taking place the same way anymore. 92% of farmers who are 55 years or, and older right now do not have this plan. So what happens when you don't have a plan in place? You sell. So in the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to see the largest land transfer we've ever seen in history. This is substantial to this industry, and also it's a very interesting time in the market when land valuations are the highest ever we've seen. In the last five years, we've actually seen a lot of areas in Canada, especially the most fertile land, double in price. So, who do you talk to, where do you go? This is Crop Top. It's a platform for farmers to leverage AI in making today's decisions based on tomorrow. So we're not just talking about the transition process anymore. What we're talking about is a platform for farmers, the new age farmers, where it doesn't rely on history being passed on from one farmer to another. It's a platform where you can go and you're not um, held back by the old process. What's included in this platform currently is uh, We'll get into the actual demo, but uh, wildfire forecast. So being able to see what perils the farm that you currently have or the one that you're interested in has. Production trends. So what is the crop you are interested in and what are the trends of that crop going forward? Same with price. Interestingly enough, not always is the production and the price correlated. So it's good to know is even though the, the production trend is up or down, the price not, uh, might match that same trend line. And then also farmhand. There's a lot of odd questions to ask. So what are all the paperwork that you have to do if you want to start bee farming? There's a lot of different types of farming going on based off of people's new interests. We also have a lot of farmers coming from different countries where their skill sets are a lot different than the, the native type of farming that typically goes on in Canada. So where do they go for those questions? You can try and Google, but sometimes you just can't find the exact source you're looking for right off the top. So it's a dedicated chatbot that helps you answer those more specific agriculture questions. So insights to farming risks, economics, and industry knowledge powered by AI. Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> so how it works, the technical components of our project. Okay, 
Okay, so, um, yes. okay, so we had uh, three types of data. We had time series data, we had text, and we had images. Um, we used several, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> We used several techniques to handle each type of them because uh, the data sets were very limited. We had very limited timing and uh, very limited resources as well. So for the images we used, uh, we tried to predict which areas in, the, in Canada would have wildfires. Uh, for that, we used the unified deeply semi-supervised framework for satellite image analysis. Uh, so we grabbed a lot of uh, images uh, from the Google Maps API and we created patches from that, so divided into squares, and we tried to predict the likelihood of that area having a fire in the near future. Um, I didn't work on this. Uh, my coworker worked on it. I tried to understand it much to explain it, so. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as you know, with images, we need a lot of images to train a good model. And it's very, uh, like, the usual practice it is to grab a pre-trained model and then try to build uh, the model up from there. Uh, so for data, we went to a Kaggle competition by, uh, I think, plant.org, which is understanding the Amazon from space. The data set was 34 gigabytes. We used only a portion of that for timing and resources. And um, we used that data set uh, to warm up the model, because we have weights and we want them to be as close as possible to understand satellite image features, features that will help us in predicting those forest fires. And then as for our data, we, as I said, we grabbed uh, images from Google APIs and then uh, we labeled them as having how many fires and the area of the fire. So uh, we use this uh, architecture for warming up the model, which <laughs> I try to understand so much. I read the paper, uh, which basically upsamples the image several times, trying to re like when you upsample an image, you get noise in there, and then you try to reconstruct it several times by encoders and decoders, and then the model will learn weights that are specific to this image as it goes and performs this task. If you're coming from NLP, as you know, we have, uh, we give a task to a model, it keeps learning until it learns some embeddings for those words that you can use for similar, sorry, similar tasks. As for the output, we had a classification and regression heads. Um, the, the benefit of having those, even though you don't use all the outputs, you can use them to keep regularizing your weights for several tasks and then you use the main one. Um, so, for the final data set, we had tabular data um, that represented, so for each patch, each image, you could have a uh, number of fires in the five, past five, 15, and 40 years. We had the fire affected areas of the, in that image in the fi past five, 15, and 40 years. Uh, we had several types of fires, so we had lightning caused and we had man-made uh, fires, and we had the total number of wildfires. And the target, of course, will it have a wildfire soon? Um, and then we had the data from the pre-trained model, and then we had the data from the, like the images themselves that we already uh, scraped. Uh, so we use a technique called special and channel squeezing citation blocks. So I think this method was also brought in from the NLP side. Uh, which is very similar to attention in my understanding that, uh, so images have channels, color channels, right? And then you have information in space. But if you just use one channel or you use um, all the space equally, you don't focus on the informative parts as much. So what this does is that it looks at the channel separately and then it tries to give weights to channels like it will give more weights to channel that carries information that will help your task better. So um, in, I'm an NLP person, so in NLP words, if you have a sentence that says, what is the price of going to the gym? And then another sentence that says, what is the price of this shampoo? Um, when you compare them, you have six words in common, but those words are not important. You, what you want to compare is the gym and the shampoo. 
So this is what it does. Like it gives more weights to those and then hence it performs better. So um, we had a good accuracy there, 88% um, uh, precision and recall of 87% 91%. Um, of course, if you go for higher recall, you risk having lower precision, but, and then if you label something as it might have a wildfire, it might not, and then you're just hurting its price. Um, but if you go with higher precision and go with lower recall, you might miss some at having wrong predictions. Um, Okay, uh, so for, as for the chatbot we used two techniques. The first one was intent classification. Uh, with intent classification, you basically try to learn embeddings of sentences. You have several hundreds of examples of sentences and then you group them together. So let's say the greet intents would be, um, hi, uh, what's going on, something like that. And then they would all be grouped after you learn them. You would hope that their embeddings would be in a certain cluster and then the buy would be separate. And then when a new intent comes in, a new question comes in, you just compare it to what you have and say, oh, this falls under those. Which you can do by, by basically doing cosine similarity, dot product, or like uh, even clustering techniques. Uh, what people usually do is that they train intents on every single like, group intents into questions that they might get. We didn't have the time to do that, so we used a simple trick by adding one intent that says ask a question. So whenever a farmer says, I want to ask a question, we take them to that intent and then we go to a search engine that can handle any questions. Uh, for the search engine, we use token classification. Um, if you're familiar with Dr. QA by Facebook, it's a framework. Uh, that does exactly that. So it looks at, at the question and it has uh, Wikipedia documents as input. It performs first TFIDF to retrieve the document or the paragraph that's closest to the question as possible. And then it does token classification. So it looks at word by word uh, and feeds it into a recurrent neural net classifying each one as how likely is it to be the start of the answer or the end of the answer. Once you label all of those, you, then you have a span of the most likely uh, start and end, and that's your shortest answer. And then we grab a longer answer to provide some more context. Uh, so basically our engine takes in the user query, goes into the main engine, which first sends it to the ROS NLU, which is an open source framework for chatbots, um, which recognizes the intent if it's a greeting, uh, goodbye intent, or if it's a question, a search engine intent. If it's a question that needs a search engine, it goes back and then this sends it to Dr. QA, which retrieves answers from the uh, legislature and documents within, that we got from the websites uh, that relate to forestry or farming. And then once we get those answers, we send them to an answers engine, which either retrieves like a preset answer or templates the answers from the search engine in a way that's, that looks good. Uh, another task that we did was to um, recommend crops that the farmers should invest in. Um, so, we, so for every crop, you can just say the name of the crop and then you can predict how, uh, how much is uh, going to be produced in the next year and how, uh, like the, the price, the future price of this product. We use data from StatCan, I believe, and several other websites. Uh, for regression, we I believe that we used Arima for this. Um, it's a simple test compared to the other ones, but it's informative, so when a, a farmer comes into a market, doesn't know what to invest in. It, this gives it a, this gives them an idea of what to do. All right, so we actually built something <laughs> in the crazy short amount of time we had. 
so the home page is our farmhand assistant. Uh, so you can see asking a question, and that's our trigger. And so uh, who approves the zoning bylaw changes? And uh, lo and behold, it comes up in short answer. You get city council, and then the long answer part of it. So. Uh, and obviously, with a little bit more time, we, we could shortcut the uh, can I ask a question, but uh, for the purposes of the demo, it was the best way we could go forward. But really what we're trying to do is give people the quickest ability to get to those answers without having to really research this information and having to decipher what's real and not real out there. Okay, so then the price and product. So. Uh, we really liked this part um, for a couple of reasons. Um, Visualization-wise, we had a lot of fun. It's, it's a lot more interactive than some of the other uh, tools we were out there looking at. Uh, and also, it helps you compare both the production and the price and for both of the same crops. Um, but in, uh, so in here, you can see how we have the trend lines and you can keep adding as many or subtracting as many. Uh, you'll notice we have a bar at the 2016. We were limited in the data sets we could get our hands on, so all of our data uh, stopped at 2016. So we had to pretend that we are at 2016 and this is going forward, uh, what those predictions look like. And uh, so it gets really interesting once you start playing around with the different pr um, crops and comparing their different uh, predictions. So. And then the last one was the area assessment. So I really enjoyed uh, speaking to this one because it's something that you can kind of relate to right away. A lot of us have been impacted by forest fires. It's kind of something a lot more prevalent. Uh, a crazy fact out there is 2.5 million hectares a year on average and increasing burn in Canada every year. That's a lot. That's over 9,000 forest fires on average. And so something as simple as forest um, or as farmland is impacted by this growing trend. So here is a, where you can punch in a postal code and you can see the probability of a forest fire that will happen in your area within the next five years. We actually were able to find one where 98% likelihood of a forest fire in the next five years. So this will be interesting to watch. And uh, we also, at the very last minute, had a bright idea, well, what about if we split this around and made this the MLS tool for farming? And so this wasn't something we really got to expand on. But farmers don't really have a great tool out there to compare and contrast the different farming, um, farmlands and agriculture areas in their neighborhood. So the idea would be to sort of push this out and say, on top of forest fire, the next one would be drought predictions. What's the likelihood of that happening? Uh, the likelihood of an infestation, what common infestations are going on. And so just keep pushing those trends uh, and being able to see a land you're interested in and also the associated risks with farming you have. Because you make a lot of different decisions when you're purchasing a farmland than you would a regular house. And that is crop talk. I guess questions now. <laughs>